This is Radio Lab. I'm Jad Abumrah. And I'm Robert Krulwich. And our topic today on Radio Lab is zoos, the saddest places on the planet. They aren't. <laughs> <laughs> what do I have to do? No, they're not the saddest places. No, you know, I'm right. The point, huh, look, despite everything we've said just up to now about the true wildness of a zoo animal, the fact remains, looking into the eyes of a live animal can be an extraordinarily transformative experience. And don't ask me. Mm-hmm. Ask Alan Rabinowitz. Oh, made it down the- okay, I'm Alan Rabinowitz. He's going to be our last stop on the show. I'm the head of a program that... Oh, my seeks to explore the Earth's last great wild areas and try to protect them. Alan Rabinowitz is a renowned animal conservationist. He's set up wildlife preserves all over the world. And, Jed, like you, he's not particularly thrilled by zoos. Although, without a zoo, and I'm thinking of the Bronx Zoo in particular, he wouldn't be who he is today. Because when Alan was very young, very young, he had a terrible stutter. Oh, I couldn't talk. My body would spasm. So if you wanted to say, coming, mom... See, coming's a hard contact. (laughs) Coming is the tongue against the upper palate. So so you couldn't get the word out? I didn't speak a fluent sentence to another human being until I went to this, finally, this clinic when I was a senior in college. A senior in college? Yeah. I never went on a date. I never kissed a girl other than my mom. How do you so connect if, to anybody? You I didn't know. connect to anybody. I had n- n- no friends. None? That's how I... None. I had little animals that I would take into the closet with me, and I would talk to them fluently. And that's how it was for Alan. For much of his childhood, the only time he says he could free his tongue to talk was in the dark with his pets. G- g- green turtles, hamsters, and hamsters. gerbils, and, and chameleons, which would all die. I would talk the way we're talking. Really? I could talk fluently to the animals. And his father one time overheard him talking in the dark. He thought, well, maybe we should take this boy to the zoo. To the Bronx Zoo. To the Bronx Zoo. He used to bring me to the old gray cat house. Horrendous. You remember the gray gray cat house? It was classic, old, concrete floors. But you'd go in, I mean, talk about an experience. You'd walk in and hear growling, roaring. I mean, it sounded incredible. Raw power. And he loved being there. He just loved it. All those noises of like 20 cats all together vocalizing at the same time. Maybe it was the sound which appealed to me as a kid that couldn't speak. And once again, in front of the zoo cats, if he was alone, he could talk. Yes, my father, it's funny, because he knew I talked to the animals. So he would stand back. He knew. If he came too close, I'd stop because I would stutter, because he was there. But if he wasn't, you could talk more fluently. I could talk fluently. And there was one, one old jaguar. And I remember, as a kid, I would stand there and I would watch that. I'd watch this magnificent huge, strong beast. This massive, strong animal had blank eyes. It just looked blank, and it was pacing back and forth and back and forth. I felt this animal is like me, because I felt strong, I felt good, I felt powerful inside, but yet I was trapped inside this cage of my body. And that's when Alan remembers turning to that cat as a kind of fellow exile and whispering a promise. That I would try to find a place for us. I remember that. I remember saying once, I'll find a place for us. And I didn't mean that particular... I don't know what I... I mean, I can't really look back and know exactly what I meant. But I, I felt no matter what, I would find a place for us. And that promise... I would find a place for us. He kept that promise in his head for for two decades. He went on to visit a speech therapist. He learned how to use his mouth and tongue to get past his stutter. Not completely, but enough to finish college and then to go on to graduate school and study wildlife ecology. And it was at his graduation party from graduate school that he got the offer that would change his life. At my going away party, my major professor asked me if I wanted to to go to Belize and, and do and study jaguars. Not just study them, count them. An objective survey of how many jaguars are really in the country. Alan asked, how do you count jaguars? 
And that's when the professor said, well, you, you got to catch him. Catch a jaguar. How do I know? I have no idea. It's like saying, go catch a dragon. Everybody knew the jaguars are stealthy, almost ghost-like cats in a forest. Nobody had ever captured jaguars in the range forest. But that was exactly what the professor was proposing. Go to a little country in Central America. Please. Go deep into its jungle, collar as many jaguars as you can so that we can track them and learn about them. Weeks pass. Picture Alan on the edge of the jungle in Belize with absolutely no idea what to do next. We opened the map of Belize. It had one dirt road down the entire country. Alan figures the only way he's going to catch a jaguar why do you do this? is to talk to people who hunt jaguars. Now, they're there. They're, uh, he calls them Mayans, and they live in the forest. And I went to, to the hunters, and they told me, run them with dogs. And one hunter still had jaguar dogs. And I'll tell you, of everything I have ever done in my life, I still rank that as the absolute hardest. Because when these dogs get on a jaguar scent, it's a bloodlust. You're running full speed through the jungle. The Mayans are in front of us, running and chopping at the same time. And I knew in my mind that there were poisonous snakes, but you can't think about it because you don't have time to look where you're running or your feet. And one time, dashing behind dogs and machete-waving hunters, disaster struck. They were just about to actually tree a jaguar when one of the crew got bit by a poisonous snake. And he died. So everybody quit. Nobody had worked for me. They all thought I was jinxed. So then I had to figure out how to capture jaguars by myself. Nobody worked for me. Finally, one Mayan Indian came to work for me, and we ended up building traps. And I would put live pigs, because they didn't want dead meat. They would want live meat, which they could kill themselves. So I'd put live pigs in the back of these traps, and I'd have to go feed the pigs every single day. The first trap I built, I built it out of two-by-fours. I caught a jaguar, and the jaguar chewed its way through the two-by-four door and busted its way out of the two-by-fours. Whoa. I mean, they are powerful animals. And then I built iron rebar. Even then, I made a mistake. One jaguar got so mad, it bit the iron rebar and pulled at the iron rebar and snapped its canines. It snapped its own canines trying to bust the iron rebar. I mean, its roots were hanging out, and I put it down. I tried to do primitive dentistry. I had to cut the roots, and it was lying there dying, and I just felt so bad. I carried the jaguar back to my cabin. I lay next to it, and it died on the floor next to me. I just lost it. I lost it. But one good thing came out of this experience. He learned to build a better trap, and so cat by cat, by cat, Alan was able, and he was the first to do this. He was able to count the jaguars in that forest, and there were thousands of them. But he had the sense, and again, this was he was first, that they were in real danger because around them, people were cutting down their forest. And if the forest went, the jaguars go too. So that's when he began uh, the campaign, which eventually led him to the prime minister. I, I was given a chance, and not only did the did the prime minister agree to meet me, but he, he invited me to address him in the whole cabinet, but only 15 minutes. Now, remember, this is a guy who for two whole decades could barely speak. His stutter, which is now less of a problem, was still there. And now he's being asked to address a prime minister and a cabinet in a high-pressure, make-it-or-break-it, 15 minutes or bust situation. I knew I couldn't stutter. I mean, I only had 15 minutes. I said, look, you will lose nothing by this. If you don't protect it, guaranteed it's going to be gone because the citrus people want it for both timber and citrus. Make it a forest reserve and make it tentative. Make it a five-year agreement. If I can't prove to you I can bring in, far, bring in outside money in five years, what do you have to lose? And if it works, you've got a jaguar preserve. You have the world's first jaguar preserve. Now, his pitch was supposed to last 15 minutes. That's the time he was allotted, but he went way over I that. ended up staying in there an hour and a half. Whoa. And the vote was a tie in the cabinet. The prime minister himself broke the tie in Alan's favor. And by the end, he agreed. The prime minister voted in my favor. That made it. It got great press as the world's first Jaguar Preserve. To this day, it's the world's only area designated specifically as a Jaguar Preserve. And by the way, the whole time with the prime minister and all, that whole time, he never stuttered. 
So Alan decided his work was more or less done. He could go home now to New York. And just before he left, he decided to go for one last walk in the jungle, a last visit. He wasn't looking for jaguars. He wasn't expecting to see one. This was his goodbye. But when he was looking down at the ground as he walked along, suddenly he thought, well, hello, because there on the ground, right in front of him, was a fresh print of a jaguar, a big one. Bigger than any I had seen in that area. And that just got my blood, the blood going. So I started following it. You almost never, never see a jaguar when you follow its tracks because it knows you're there. I mean, I was hoping against hope that maybe I'd see the jaguar, but actually I didn't think I would because they always knew I was coming and they'd always go away. And then it started getting dark, it started getting late, and I didn't want to be in the jungle at night. And I'd have a flashlight or anything. So that's when I turned around. And there was the jaguar, about 15 feet away. Behind uh, you? It was behind me. It had been behind me probably quite a ways. So it knew that you were tracking it, and it decided to find out who you were. It, it had circled around, and it probably cut off into the forest, watched me as I passed, then got back on the trail and just stayed back a good ways. And it was pretty clear this cat had been creeping closer and closer. To where by the time I turned around, it had shortened its distance between us really small. I mean, that was... So it was in, in leaping distance? I couldn't have gotten away from it. Yeah. And I kn- knew that. So I did what, what I thought was the right thing, which is make myself small, make myself subdominant, just crouch down. And then the jaguar did something which I didn't expect it to do. It sat down. That was strange to me. And then I got scared. And I stood up and I stepped back because I felt the distance was too close now. That, that it didn't like. And all this time, I mean, I'm totally aware. I have no place to go. And with no place to go, nowhere to run, Alan just stood there, frozen in place. And the jaguar rose, and it too just stood absolutely silent. Then it just turned and started walking off into the jungle. And before it disappeared into the brush, it turned back to look at me. Then I really looked it in the eyes, and they were wild eyes. There was fire in the jaguar's eyes. The last thing I remember very clearly is looking into into its eyes and thinking of seeing the jaguar in the Bronx Zoo as a child, but seeing the wildness in this animal's eyes. It didn't look anything like that cat in the cage. It showed strength and freedom. And we had just protected this incredible area, which now would be its home. And I remember telling the cat at one point that, that I'd find a place for us. Dr. Alan Rabinowitz is the director for science and exploration at the Wildlife Conservation Society. And if you want to read more about his jaguar adventures in Belize, the book is called Jaguar, One Man's Struggle to Establish the World's First Jaguar Preserve. We should wrap up. Mm -hmm. For more information on anything that you heard today, check our website, radiolab.org. We got a podcast. We do. You can sign up for it there or at iTunes. And send us an email. Let us know what you think. Radiolab at WNYC.org is the address. And Radiolab is one word. It is. I'm Chad Abumrad. And I'm Robert Krolwich. And we'll see you... At the zoo. We'll see you at the zoo. At least some of us. <laughs> First message. Radiolab is produced by Chad Abumrad. Ellen Horn, senior producer. Lulu Miller, assistant producer. Production executive, Dean Capello. Production support by Sarah Pellegrini, Brett Beyer, Scott Goldberg... Alaska Keyville, Sam Leviander, Avian Mitra, Ryan Scammell, and Jacob Weinberg. Also, very special thanks to Tamar Lewin and Amy Bush's class at North Star Academy for their musical contributions. Hi there, this is Jocelyn Ford, just Skyping in from Beijing to let you know that Radio Lab is 
supported by a grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Radio Lab is produced by WNYC, New York Public Radio, and distributed by NPR, National Public Radio. Can't believe I'm doing this. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations and the Kaufman Foundation of Kansas City, the Foundation of Entrepreneurship, on the web at K-A-U-S-S-M-A-N.org, and the Annenberg Foundation, advancing public well-being to improve communication, on the web at AnnenbergFoundation.org, and the Ford Foundation, a resource for innovative people and institutions worldwide, on the web at FordFound.org. This is NPR. National Public Radio.